I've, in the last decade in my medical practice, I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to undo the damage from medications that other doctors are prescribing. Well-meaning physicians, don't get me wrong, but they're putting people on acid suppressing drugs like proton pump inhibitors and leaving them on there for years as opposed to, okay, I'm using this to treat an acute ulcer for six weeks. They are putting people on antibiotics, long courses of antibiotics, steroids, immunosuppressive drugs, et cetera. And as, as you pointed out, Cyrus, the problem is stomach acid, not only is it the main and most important ingredient for digestion to happen, it is also one of our body's most important antiviral defenses and defenses against pathogens because stomach acid unravels and denatures viral protein, like the spike proteins on SARS-CoV-2, and essentially protects you. So what happened with the, you know, how this book came to be, the other three books were really all about digestive health. Um, the first book, Gut Bliss, was sort of a love letter to all my patients out there who were bloated, who were being told, eh, you know, you just have IBS, whatever. It's like, no, we're going to roll up our sleeves. And I'm going to explain it all to you. What's going on in your GI tract so that you can solve the problem. The second book, The Microbiome Solution, was really, I think, a little bit too early in 2015, seven years ago. I think that book now, people are like, oh, now I see what she's talking about. But The Microbiome Solution is about how dysbiosis contributes to all these different diseases. The third book, The Bloat Cure, was just a quickie, 101 Things That Bloat You, A to Z, each one is a page, sort of cliff notes. But this book, in... 2020, a study came out, a large population-based study. So we're a few months into the pandemic, summer 2020, population-based study of about 54,000 patients asking the simple question, does being on a proton pump inhibitor, an acid blocker, you know, Nexium, Asifex, Protonix, Prilosec, there's a whole bunch of them, does that increase your risk of COVID? Now, as a gastroenterologist, I would have said certainly, because we've been seeing an increased risk of different infections, viral infections, outbreaks on cruise ships, norovirus, rotavirus, campylobacter, C. diff, viral and bacterial infections for years because of this lack of stomach acid. So I would have said, yeah, it probably increases the risk. But even I was shocked to see that for people taking a proton pump inhibitor once a day, the risk was double. And for people taking one of those drugs twice a day, the risk was three to four fold. And what I realized, Cyrus, you know, I, the first thing I do is I usually ask my husband, hey, did you know this? Because he's not in medicine. He's a cybersecurity, counterterrorism, counterintelligence guy. So I'll, I, I was like, so you know that not having stomach acid makes you more susceptible to viruses, right? And he looked at me and was like, ah, how would I know that? I didn't know that. And then I asked a couple of my internal medicine colleagues. And they were like, yeah, yeah, now that you explain it, I kind of get it. But then, Cyrus, I asked one of my GI colleagues specifically about COVID, and he thought I was making it up. He hadn't read the study. And of course, as you know, gastroenterologists prescribe these drugs like water. And so that's when I said, okay, there's some stuff here that people probably need to know. And, and I spoke to my wonderful book agent, Howard Yoon, who's been with me through all four books. And he said, you know, it might be a great editorial, like you could talk about this. And then a couple months later, one of the first studies came out showing that the health of the microbiome was the most accurate predictor, predicted outcome with 92% accuracy. That's way more accurate than age, comorbid disease, gender, you know, blood markers like C-reactive protein, et cetera, combined. So I was like, wait a second, what's going on in the microbiome is the most predictive factor and people don't know this. So there was just, you know, Point after point after point, I started researching a lot about polio. And one of the really you know, incredible statistics is that viruses like poliovirus, which is kind of a sister virus to SARS-CoV-2, both RNA viruses, these viruses replicate about 250 times faster when you have a fever compared to a normal body temperature. So when you have this viral infection, you have a fever, it's your body's way of slowing down viral replication, halting it. And what is everybody doing? Reaching for the Tylenol and the Motrin to bring down the fever and not understanding that they're sabotaging one of the body's main host defenses. So I, you know, I, I look at all of this and I say, you know, these viruses are out there and they can be scary, but it's very clear that the health of the host is as important, if not more important, 
than the potency of the pathogen. And I want people to not be scared, to understand we have all these incredible host defenses. We have mucus, we have fever, we have the gut lining, we have gut bacteria, we have stomach acid, we have all of these other things. We have things not related to the gut, like stress and sleep that are also in the book that are potent, potent at combating viruses. I mean, the, the study is that people who are chronically sleep deprived have about a 76% greater likelihood of becoming infected. So a reminder to people that exposure does not have to equal infection. An infection does not have to equal debilitating illness, and debil debilitating illness does not have to equal death. So all the other things we have in our medical armamentarium are important. Vaccines, social distancing, hand washing, all of these things. So this information is very much complementary to that. So whatever people's personal opinion is on vaccines and boosters or, or masks or anything else, this book is non-denominational in the sense that this book is really focused on what you, as a potential host of these viruses, can do to strengthen your innate host defenses, which are very much located in the gut. So it, it felt almost like a, a public service announcement, quite frankly, Cyrus, to put this information together for people in a way that was really accessible and with a really in-depth plan in the third part of the book that tells you I mean, I go into specifics like, okay, here are the medications that are ruinous to your gut microbiome. Here are the questions to ask your doctor about alternatives, alternative dosing, alternative medication. You know, could you do an every other day dose? Could you take this medication instead? Because I realized that people really needed that manual, that practical information for, okay, you're telling me this is bad, but I have really bad reflux. So what else can I do? There's you know, detailed information, how to taper off a PPI, what to take instead. So it was, um, you know, it was tough to write because the science was changing literally every day. I'd read a couple articles and go to bed, and in the morning, there'd be two new articles that were either adding to the information or maybe contradicting it. So it was, uh, you know, it was a, a whirlwind roller coaster writing it, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to have been able to get it all down. And what we've done is we've made the citations digital on a website so that, that we can keep updating them. This is great, actually. This is a, a very timely book, and um, the information can go a very long way. Now, you mentioned that the diversity of your gut microbiome is one of the most accurate predictors of your viral susceptibility. So if an individual says, okay, cool, like how can I test whether or not my gut microbiome is in a quote-unquote healthy state or a you know distressed state? Can you give us some insight here into what test they could take? Is it a blood test? Is it a stool sample? Explain. Sure. It's, you know, the microbiome testing is stool analysis, but I will caution people that that testing is still kind of in its infancy. So a few years ago, several years ago, when one of the first companies that was doing microbiome testing sort of direct to consumer, because of course the stuff has been available in a lab setting, came on the scene, I started testing all my patients. I have a large population of patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. That's sort of my jam, autoimmune diseases in GI. And I started testing everybody. I was like, look, this is a very inexpensive test. It's simple. You know, you swab the toilet paper with a little Q-tip, you mix it in this little thing and you send it off. But what I found, Cyrus, was that the results really weren't adding a ton. You know, people, it wasn't like the results were directing care. Right. It was the clinical symptoms that were directing care. So regardless of what the microbiome testing came back, if somebody had active disease and was flaring, we were still treating it. And, and we know the basic brushstrokes for how to improve the microbiome. It's to improve the diversity of plant fiber that you're eating. It's to stop practices like antibiotics and acid blockers, et cetera, that are destroying the gut microbes. And it's to get more exposure to soil microbes. Those are sort of the, the big three. And we're not at the stage right now with microbiome testing where we can be really prescriptive with the results. And we can say, aha, you need to eat more celery. You need to eat more strawberries. You need to, you know, stop cow's milk. Or it, it just really isn't at that point that you know people talk about personalized medicine and personalized medicine is really important, particularly for determining risk, right? I, did a, I do a free office hour session every Tuesday for an hour on a different topic and people get to ask whatever questions they want. And yesterday's was on 10 essential questions to ask your doctor if you've been prescribed an antibiotic. 
And obviously, number one there is just simply, is this antibiotic absolutely necessary? But we go through, like, could you use a narrow-spectrum antibiotic? Do you get have the culture results back, et cetera? And one of the points I was making there is that my decision, and I think most doctors' decisions, hopefully, about whether to prescribe an antibiotic, if you're in that gray zone of, you know, maybe this could help, is to take a personalized look and see, okay, well, what's, what's this person's past medical history? Is this somebody who has had antibiotic-associated diarrhea the last three times they've taken antibiotics, which is a real sign that all is not well in the microbiome? On the other hand, is this somebody who's at high risk for a terrible pneumonia and has compromised lung function, and we have to make sure that doesn't happen? So you have to constantly weigh the risks and the benefits. But the idea that you can swab the stool, you get this you know, prescription for exactly what to do is not, is not where we are. And people ask a lot, you know, should they test it? I think that contributing to the science for all of us as citizen scientists is a great idea. So I direct people to sites like the American Gut Project, which is a nonprofit that can help add to what we know because what we're able to do is develop these sort of microbial signatures, right? So we can see, okay, patients with Crohn's tend to have a microbiome that looks like this. People with rheumatoid arthritis have one that looks like this. Diabetes is associated with these changes so that we can all make use of these tools for diagnosing, for treating, et cetera. But the idea that you can individually say specifically what you should eat or not eat, we're not quite there. What is useful for the testing is looking at the percent diversity, and that is helpful. So you see, gosh, if that number is really low, and it's relative to everybody else who's been tested, so it depends, right? If you're testing at a site like American Gut Project that has you know, thousands and thousands of specimens, it's much more meaningful than a smaller private company that maybe doesn't have as big a data bank of stool. But the diversity is important. So that's a thing I would recommend that people pay attention to, is the diversity and probably levels of Fecalobacterium prosnitzii. But a lot of the other stuff, and as you know, also, Cyrus, it's not just the bacteria itself, it's also the metabolites, right? So Correct. we're interested in levels of F. prosnitzii, but we're really interested in short-chain fatty acids, and that's not something that we can commercially measure reliably yet. 